Thunder Bay is an isolated community of 100,000 located in the boreal forest region of northwestern Ontario, hundreds of kilometers away from major cities. Historically, Thunder Bay is known for its shipping, mining and forestry industries and little agricultural production. So Thunder Bay, like other isolated communities, is dependent on goods and foodstuffs imported from other parts of the world, making it vulnerable to a supply chain that could be easily disrupted. My customers love local foods. If, uh, if we had a better uh, uh, distribution chain of local foods, uh, they would love it. It's definitely a market that my customers want daily. And if they could buy, uh, like the Bruins, local tomatoes every day and Baloo's local corn and peas or any locally grown produce or local grown, locally raised beef, cattle, uh, chicken, you know, I just love the fact that it's grown locally. In Thunder Bay, local is the new organic because local means not having to transport foods across continents or rely on industrial methods of production to feed families. At present, the region does not produce enough to feed itself, but local consumers and producers are working to ensure the city's food security. The Food Security Research Network, in partnership with Lakehead University and other organizations and dedicated community members, works to enhance food literacy, develop food system infrastructure, and support local producers in their efforts to make a living by feeding others. In northwestern Ontario, farming is not an obvious career choice. Unlike the established patterns of the Canadian prairies or the Niagara region, producing food in northwestern Ontario requires a special kind of farmer. Who are these people and what are the challenges they face as they try to make a difference? Walter Skep's parents emigrated from Holland in 1981, where their family had a long history of cheesemaking. They began with a dairy farm and opened their Gouda cheese farm in 1995, following years of research, work and adaptation. Today, the elder Skeps are nearing retirement. Walter and his brother Martin now run the twin dairy and cheesemaking operations with their families, earning a living through hard work and dedication. My name is Walter Skep, and uh, I'm the owner of Thunder Oak Cheese Farm, and uh, we're right now outside of uh, Thunder Oak Cheese Farm uh, in the middle of uh, the Slate River Valley. Uh, we produce uh, about uh, 1,500 litres a day, so that's about 150 kilos a day, and we do that about 200 days a year, so about, <laughs> yeah, about 30 tonne a year or so, I would say. Most of it gets sold locally here, about 85% gets sold out of our retail store. And then we also have a few smaller stores in Thunder Bay that we sell to. And then whatever's left over, we also have a distributor in Toronto that uh, carries our cheese as well. And then we also have a website where we sell a small amount of cheese to as well. The people got to realize where their food comes from, you know. It's gotten to the point where, you know, these big super stores, you go and, you know, it, you know when we young, like even one generation ago, people would come around with the food or they, they would still go to the farm and pick up their milk. I know my mother-in-law, you know, they used to go to the farm and they, they pick up their milk from the farmer and it's just that whole, you know, where your food comes from, it's got so far removed so fast, like in one generation, people just sort of forgot where their food came from. Like, you know, milk, milk still comes from cows and cheese does too, so. We bought a pasteurizer from Europe which is fine for pasteurizing in Europe, and you can buy the, the European cheese you can buy here, but you can't use that same pasteurizer here to make Canadian cheese. It was actually, technically it was too advanced for their, it wasn't, again, they're working out of a manual, and it wasn't, this pasteurizer wasn't in their manual, so it couldn't, obviously it couldn't work. So they, so we had to rebuild the whole pasteurizer to Canadian standard, which, you know, I had, uh, had people from Europe actually coming down and they said, well, yeah, this is how we did it about 30 years ago, but not, they've actually, they've, their standards actually went up, but it's actually had to downgrade the pasteurizer. 
Our biggest problem, I think, is here is getting the infrastructure set up so that we can, you know, process the food because it's been, you know, for years and years has been the big cheap food, you know, buy cheap food and grow cheap food. And so it's just cheaper to do it elsewhere with labor and different things. So I think our biggest problem, you know, to, to be able to tell even if we could produce enough, we'd have to, you know, start sort of from the bottom and start, you know, processing our own food. You know, there's someone uh, milling wheat now and, you know, so people can bake bread from the wheat that's grown here in Thunder Bay. It's, it's good that he's finally starting to make a little bit of headway, but it does take a couple years. It's not where you can just sort of jump in and say, you know, you're going to make all sorts of money the first couple of years. It doesn't, usually it doesn't work that way. I mean, sometimes you get lucky, but not, not too often. I mean, even for us, if we didn't have the dairy farm to support the cheese factory the first couple of years, I don't know if we'd still be here or not. So it's, uh, it's hard sometimes. The he Walter mentions is Jeff Burke owner and operator of Burl Creek Farm, Thunder Bay's local grain mill. Like Walter, Jeff grew up on a dairy farm. Unlike him, Jeff chose to leave the family farm and attend university, where, interestingly enough, he ended up working on a project as an intern with the Food Security Research Network. At its completion, the project, which resulted in a market research and business plan for a small milling operation, lacked only a young entrepreneur to take the reins and move it forward into business development. Uh, my name is Jeff Burke, and uh, I'm actually I'm a farmer and also a grain miller. So we, we have a farm uh, where we grow all our own cereal grains, and then we mill them um, on site and make uh, flour and a variety of products. We use um, uh, granite stones to mill our flour, um, whereas most of those other flour mills use steel rollers. Um, so the granite stones actually they spin a lot slower and, and keep the flour a lot cooler so it, it keeps a little bit more of its flavor um, whereas the, the steel, uh, steel mills are a lot quicker, a little bit hotter, um, the flour maybe loses its flavor um, but the advantage of the steel mills is that they are way faster and a lot more efficient. Grain differs slightly from region to region in, in both uh, taste and quality so I guess we do kind of have our own regional regional flavor of grain, you could say. We, we've grown uh, cereal grains here for, for many years. Just it, it's, you know, it is a little bit of a challenge, but there's not a, it's not an issue like uh, growing a little bit warmer seasoned crops uh, like soybeans or corn. Um, you know, wheat, we grow wheat, barley and rye, and uh, those three are all uh, more suited to cooler climates anyway, so. Um, the marketing is our biggest challenge, marketing our products um, locally and regionally and distributing both locally and regionally. Um, within the Thunder Bay area it's, it's not that difficult but uh, because our region is so expansive that it's difficult to get our products um, uh, you know, as far west as the Manitoba border or, or heading east. Um, transportation becomes a huge cost. Uh, when you're looking at cost, like let, let's say the cost of our product is, is it's higher than the, the uh, larger producers or the larger mills. Um, and the main, the main uh, reason is scale as well. You know, we, we're, when I said we're growing 120 acres um, versus you know, many farms in, in Western Canada are growing a couple thousand. So they can grow uh, grain a lot more efficiently than we can. Um, and, and the large mills like Robin Hood can mill flour a lot more efficiently than we can. Um, so that, that definitely adds to the cost of the end product. It seems like um, um, the cost of production escalates faster than the, uh, the return, but uh, yeah, the diesel, you know, our fuel is expensive, um, labor is expensive, um, machinery repairs are expensive. By selling locally, we have to reflect some of that into the cost of our, our end product. So as, as you know, these these costs of production increase, we kind of have to relate that back to our, our the cost of our final product and not keep, continually try to absorb that ourselves. We do have to use inputs like, like potash and phosphorus and nitrogen um, to supplement what we what we remove from the crop. Um, and it is, um, you know, that that is probably the most expensive um, part of growing crop or the most expensive input to growing a crop. Uh, sourcing it is not necessarily a challenge just because we have a, a farm cooperative here in Thunder Bay that, that can bring it in in bulk. But I think a major um, industry probably in Thunder Bay would be processing. That, that seems to be a stumbling block for a lot of producers is, is to get their product processed and um, there's probably room for 
you know, new processing facilities. Like we built a flour mill, but there could be others, um, you know, to get that basically that raw farm product um, into a platable or a sellable product. It's not even necessarily the, the, the direct um, uh, jobs of, of agriculture, the agricultural industry. It's, it's quite often it's de-escalating spin-off jobs. Um, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, these, these farm operations or processors, they, they quite often will have employees and these employees will, um, you, know, you know, keep a lot of the, the revenue dollars within the economy um, by, by purchasing food locally and, and other resources. Um, so, so it is, um, you know, just because there's only, there may be only a few jobs available for young people, um, it could definitely escalate into um, a, a greater economic benefit for the local community. Jeff and Walter demonstrate the potential for making a living from value-added farm products on the local scale. But what about the people who are producing the basics? Like most farming operations, Peter Brink's beef and hog farm relies on a number of inputs to support crops. Unlike Walter and Jeff, Peter needs a well-paying job off-farm to provide a living income. My name is Peter Brink. I'm uh, owner-operator of Sand Acres Farm, um, and I grow beef and hogs. You know, it costs a lot of money to do this. <laughs> I couldn't do it without my job. Well, I've been teaching for about two years at Lakewood University, and uh, now I'm tenure trapped. I don't know anybody in the beef business who can make a living at it by itself. I only own about 230 acres myself. I probably farm altogether around 400, 450. I think one of the main challenges of raising cattle are the input costs. The input costs have gone up exponentially in the last few years. Fertilizer costs on this place is about 20% of the annual annual income. I was talking to my dad the other day and he said, you know, the fields need potash. And I was saying, well, that costs a lot of money. And he remembers back to when potash was $130 a ton. Now it's 700. It's actually down from about 1200 last year. And the price of cattle haven't gone up. So I think yeah, the biggest challenge to anybody who's trying to grow beef and at least trying to make a living at it or break even would be the input costs. If it was not for the abattoir close by, I couldn't even do this. Um, I'd be shipping out west. So having Thunder Bay meat processing a couple kilometers up the road, um, it's the best thing in the world. There are also other things like the Thunder Bay Co-op. They sell us all of our um, inputs and and parts, it all works together. Um, you take one part out and we're finished. I am not organic, and I would never claim to be. And there's regulations now on whether or not you can call yourself organic. And unless you're certified, you cannot use that word. If I were to go in that direction, I would have to get somebody flown in from Southern Ontario at my own expense for a couple of days. It's, it's a huge expense. I don't think you'd actually get anything back from it. My personal opinion, I'm, I would never go in that direction. I don't think the market would bear it, the additional costs of organic production, at least not in Thunder Bay, right? I was looking through the, through one of the magazines that I get the other day and I was looking at, uh, they had all the feedlots listed and there were, there were anywhere from 800 animals to, to I think the largest one was 3,500. I couldn't imagine having that much cattle walking around my property. The animals I don't think fare quite as well as they would out, you know, out in pastures. So ultimately their health suffers. You know, the, the way they raise them, they're basically stuffed full of food their entire lives. And they're medicated. I produce about 40 animals a year. I could cut them out at, uh, at seven months of age and ship them out west and a feedlot will buy them. So you got animals coming in from 20 different areas. You're moving all these animals into one area. All of a sudden you got diseases from all over Canada coming into one condensed area. So they spread through the herd quite quickly. I, what I do here, um, you know, I call, it, I call it natural beef. I don't use antibiotics unless I have to. It's, it would never be used as a prophylactic. 
It's all processed at Thunder Bay Meat Processing, but I do bring it back here. I sell it out of the yard. I also sell it at the market in town. People love it. I've, they, I, I, I've never been more, I don't think this place has ever been more supported in its, in its existence because we've got people clamoring for this stuff. Although his farm is doing well, he still has to maintain an off-farm job. Beef prices are at an all-time low as a result of factory farming, making it impossible for small-scale farms to compete based on price. Other local farmers face the same challenges. Like Peter, Jeff, and Walter, the Beluzes grew up as part of a family operation, relying on the accumulated knowledge and manpower of as many as three generations at a time. Well, I'm Jody Beluz. And I'm Kevin Beluz, and this is Beluz Farms in Slate River Valley. And I'm the third generation of Beluzes that are working this land now. So uh, like my father and my grandfather before me, um, we're still here. From a production standpoint in this area, obviously it's a different climate. We're a short season here, although that's definitely changing lately. But, um, you know, we used to reliably say we had 90 frost-free days to grow uh, in this, this area. And um, so it, that's challenging in that you have very tight seasons, windows of opportunity to get things either A, planted or just growing uh, to sufficient levels that you can, can get your harvest off. Fruit and veg is very different in that it's so labor intensive and yeah. ma manual labor is really, there's, you know, there's some fruits that can be picked mechanically, but, um, you know, and vegetables for sure, but um, a large chunk of it is, is still manual labor. And so that is one of the limiting factors for sure is getting it, getting it off the fields in timely manner. Um, we don't have the same access to labor as they would in other markets. And um, so when we try and focus on using only local kids, the, that's a, a very limiting factor in terms of getting enough um, uh, off the fields in time as well for, for harvesting. One of our challenges marketing wise is uh, really teaching people um, in Thunder Bay especially about seasonality and um, about why it's important probably to think about eating say strawberries only for the three week season that we have them available in our area because of um, you know what's required to get berries from places as far away as California and Mexico so that's a challenge I think for us is is um, educating the local people about how much better local strawberries taste and then how much better they really are for all of us um, you know, whether it's health-wise or whether it's um, environmentally as well. When we say value for food, part of that equation is 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 price. Right. You know, let's, I we don't want to. I don't want to beat around the bush yeah. too much about it. But it really is what people are paying for food, and the you know the policy in in North America and most you know. Western countries at least has been a policy towards cheap food since the Second World War and it's really driven the price of food down where now we're paying you know below 10 percent of our our disposable income towards food where it used to be 40 percent or more and um, the result of that is is that people are having a hard time making a living farming and hence yeah. we have less farmers um, so th that is one of the very first steps as well if we can increase the value of food to people so that we can increase the price of food and I know that's not something people want to hear no. maybe but I understand and I understand that obviously yeah. but that is the bottom line if this was a more uh, economically viable business you would have more farmers yeah. plain plain and simple our current food system is 100 percent um, you know fossil fuel based so that should raise some alarm bells in exactly what you're talking about is what that means if some of those um, laneways such as even transportation get cut off beyond that though it's um, you know what's required of large-scale agriculture in terms of fossil fuel consumption um, to get the current food we're eating to market that's pretty scary when you start looking into all of that and if somehow those inputs were all cut out cut off and probably eventually will be from that form of agriculture what is going to be the replacing system and so I think what we want to be looking at is creating that a different system that is more viable and sustainable and has a long-term vision to it before we run into that problem where we don't have a choice so I mean investing in getting your food as close to home as possible just makes common sense because there's a safety and there's a security to that and going back to trying to figure out ways to store your own produce whether it's through freezing or drying or root selling some of those old traditions that we had before we um, you know had this kind of instant access to food 
um, is important because I think what we'll see is the instant access is, is not gonna last forever. Today's large-scale food production relies on mechanization, chemical fertilizers, and fossil fuels to produce food at levels undreamed of when the first pioneers turned the soil. Economies of scale let large corporations produce, process, and distribute their products at a fraction of what it would cost small-scale local farmers. However, farming is on the rise in this area. One of the advantages for new farmers here is that the entry costs, like land, are considerably lower in northwestern Ontario. Farming is becoming a more attractive career opportunity. Teresa Daniele raises market garden vegetables on her property in Thunder Bay. From dawn till dusk during the growing season, she and her husband labor in their greenhouses and gardens to produce vegetables naturally, enjoying a retirement income and a healthy diet for their entire family. My name is Teresa Daniele, and most of the time, all my life, most I just do things in the garden. I love gardening. I love it. It's, uh, it's my life. I'm not a person who stays inside. I've been here for uh, 49 years in Canada. I never went to a restaurant to eat. So that tells you that I cook at home for my family, for my kids, for even now, even for friends if they come. Yeah, yeah. My family was used to do things like I do. You know, we were, we were, we were raising in a farm, and that's what we did all our life. But I mean, I work in the garden, and I love the dirt. You have to touch. That's where we, that's where life comes from, it comes from the dirt. I haven't been to the grocery store to buy, like, uh, vegetables or stuff like that. It's uh, been a sense of me. I don't even, I, I didn't even, I don't even know what they sell in the store right now. And they have tomatoes. I mean, nobody ever had seen tomato probably like this. One vine alone has about 10 of them. Yeah, so. This is one, these are vine tomatoes. These are the cascade. And people like these ones here. These are the cascade. See the size of the English cucumbers? Look at this. Look, look at this, two of them. Look, look, look how beautiful they are, look at this. Are they beautiful? You can live without buying yourself a pair of new clothes, but you cannot live without buying yourself some food, right? And everybody looking for natural stuff, which we don't put nothing in our garden. In our garden, it's always natural. If we only do it's just uh, manure from the goats, uh, whatever we can get, and we don't put no pesticides whatsoever. If we have some disease, we just discard, and we get whatever we can, and uh, that's about it. People don't understand how important it is for everybody who has a piece of land to do something with it. Because in the piece of land like we have, you can grow all the vegetables you want for the whole year. Sometimes you can put it, uh, you can freeze it, you can put it in jars, or you can have a root cellar and put all, like a potato, beets, carrots, uh, 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 anything you want, like in this storage business. Oh, beautiful. For those with the knowledge, the time, and the land, growing, preserving, and storing your own vegetables is a great way to ensure you get safe, natural produce. It also means you can feed yourself if our current fossil fuel based food system breaks down. But this option isn't even a consideration for most of the population. For the vast majority of North Americans, city living and skill specializations has moved them far away from their food's origins. As our relationships with food grows more and more distant, maybe we should be asking ourselves, if large industry lets us down, will there be enough small farmers left to feed us? Having regional food um, definitely is a lot more secure than, than relying on a few large um, processors or a few large producers. Um, and, and so I think by diversifying our regional food, um, we would definitely um, enhance the, the security of our own uh, food system in northern Ontario. We do have the land here. We have the production. There, is, there are some farmers in this area that grow um, significant amounts of wheat. And as far as our milling capacity, we have a lot of room for expansion. Um, so I think we could, you know, we probably could um, meet the needs of the, the community. Maybe not immediately, but, but with enough planning, we probably could.
And I think for the long-term food security of our communities, we want to be really uh, bolstering the profession of agriculture and, and filling it with, with the professionals who are doing it. So mm -hmm. it's, I think it's uh, important while we talk a lot about small-scale agriculture, we really want to be creating opportunities for more people who can farm and make a living from full -time. it. Full-time. Full-time. And, and that, um, I think, is the, in the best interest of everyone in that we're going to have more food uh, locally available in the community. Plus, uh, people who are able to do something full-time obviously have an interest in that. They're maybe taking extra courses, making sure uh, they're following all the food safety guidelines. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they're treating their staff properly. We have uh, health and safety regulations now in agriculture that is a, a somewhat newer regulation we have to adhere to. And so when you're doing it uh, professionally, then you, you meet sort of those standards, um, which I think is really important in terms of, of making sure we're, we're getting people into the business who are then going to be around for the long term. So is it practical right now for young people to go into farming? Um, maybe not quite yet but we're getting there and um, and we need really some young enthusiastic people to unfortunately take that leap and get into it and help to to push this revolution along really the food security research network yeah. believes one of the first steps in growing the profession of agriculture is closing the gap between people and their food in 2008 they created roots to harvest as a teaching tool for the community Roots to Harvest and its urban youth garden bring young people together with community members, garden mentors, and farmers. Teens spend their summer tending the youth garden and bussing out to local farms where they learn how to keep farm animals and larger market gardens. Hi, my name is Heidi Zettel. Um, I guess I am a gardener. <laughs> I don't know, we don't really have an official title. <laughs> we, we work here and do good things, I guess. Garden coordinator. Partners in Crime. <laughs> and my name is Jody Mitchell and I started out with this project as a volunteer and got hired on as a garden mentor, yeah, assistant garden mentor. and then coordinator of the project. Uh, so this is the Roots to Harvest Urban Youth Garden and this is the third year that it's been going on. Um, this plot, we're, we're sort of squatting on this land. The, <laughs> the person who owns it, his name is Bruno Lafredo and he's a contractor a developer in town. And he was kind enough to let us uh, start an urban garden project here three years ago. Um, we're really grateful that he's let us use, use the land. And um, over the past three years, we've been bringing in soil. It's all cement under here. So, so all the soil that you see that's, that, um, that we're growing food in has been, has been brought in um, with the help of many volunteers and many, lots of uh, sweaty, happy people putting their putting their heart and soul into this place to make it a um, vegetable garden. Great thing about, about this site is we're right in downtown Thunder Bay. So people can see the food grow. They see the seeds go in in the springtime and, and see germination and see things coming up. And then they can actually come and, and buy vegetables right from, our, from this site. <laughs> so things are harvested right as people are coming up to buy it. Um, and I think that's really important part of, of understanding food security is, is um, it's important for people to know what, where their food comes from and what it takes to grow it. I think we've become disconnected from that, uh, being able to buy so many different types of vegetables grown all over the world in a grocery store and it's really easy. And I think it's important to have a place like this to remind people that it takes a lot of work and a lot of knowledge and a lot of hands to to grow food and this is just a really great reminder so I think it's a really important project. Uh, my name is Erin Beagle and I'm the project coordinator for Roots to Harvest. The, 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 this is the ideal spot to have started this project. I can't, I can't think of a better I can't think of a better spot. So we have so many brownfield space here that could be developed like so much. There's so every time I drive around, I just see another spot where you could put in a garden, and and I don't think there would ever not be a need to have a, a space become a place where people could learn that. Personally, from a roots to hearts, from a roots to harvest perspective, we need more because we run out of things to do here. Thirteen people running this space. It's it's an acre, but it, it's uh, it's not enough to do every day. So we head out to farms and stuff, but we need more so we can do more. And we do want people to come in here and wander around and go, what is that? And how do they do that? And what is this space? Like, we really want people to come in and explore it and, and claim it as their own. I think, especially where I see our program important for youth is that 
in a traditional school system, they're not necessarily or typically, I guess, getting the support that they need to grow and be whole people. Like, whereas a project like this, like we we have youth who who don't really do well in the school system, and I think here they come and they can flourish, and they are given the opportunity to like work with their hands and be physical and joke around and like and I don't know, it's 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 just a it's. It's a different dynamic and I think that a lot of kids maybe don't have that kind of opportunity to be expressive and creative and do something great for their community and to eat good food and work hard and so I think that it's huge, it's, it's just great. And we've had youth um, who've worked with us for a summer go on to have different agricultural jobs around town and mm -hmm. uh, start their own gardens in their own backyard, and, which is a, a big undertaking and you don't hear of a lot of youth doing it. Yeah. Um, but there's some and the some that are doing it are doing it really well and doing it with heart. So it's, it's really cool to see and I think it's a, a big part of the future to have uh, people getting into gardening in their backyards and in community gardens and mm -hmm. knowing the farmers in the community. And yeah. No, it's a step in the right direction. For me, I mean, I, I feel like I have one of the most meaningful jobs in the city because I'm, you know, I'm working with great kids and I'm growing great food and I'm doing it in the middle of downtown and it's, it's pretty awesome. I really believe in what we do here. It's, it's a really beautiful thing. Small scale farming needs to be a viable profession in order to attract young people. That means fair wages for farmers and real value placed on the food they produce. Small steps, like Roots to Harvest and the Urban Youth Garden, are more important than ever because they turn consumers into producers. In northwestern Ontario, the number of farmers and small farms are growing. A budding local food movement is increasing the demand for locally produced foods increasing the interest in agriculture as a career option, and revealing the gaps in our food security infrastructure. Roots to Harvest, the Flour Mill Research, and other food security research network projects are important steps on the road to a sustainable local food system.